Okay, so I have something of a confession. I get totally out of control when I have a crush, and I suppose if you were to phrase it so insensitively, then I guess you could call me a stalker. It probably took way longer than it should for me to realize it too. Like I just figured I was, I don't know, intense, passionate, whatever you want to call it. When actually, what I feel for guys is, well, as my psychiatrist put it, it's unhealthy. Whenever I have a crush on a guy, it builds and builds until it's almost completely out of control. Sure, I get the usual stuff at first. Butterflies in my tummy. That giddy euphoria people feel when their crush is around. But I get other things too. Like, there's a lot more and some things that people might consider kind of scary too. When I like a guy, they're constantly on my mind. They're usually the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning and usually the last thing I think about before I sleep too. I look up every social media account they have and guys tend to be much less careful about their privacy settings which makes that whole thing super easy. I make sure to see every single post, every comment, every friend, every photo they're in. I check their social media accounts usually more than four or five times a day. I also google them online hoping to stumble across anything new. For years I told myself that I just like knowing things about my crushes. Like isn't that the point of loving someone? To know them as well as you know yourself? Well, again, according to my psychiatrist, not in quite the same way as I imagine. I track down where they live and spend way too long on Google Street View just admiring the place. I never go by or do anything though. I never want the crush to know how obsessed I really am. That would be absolutely mortifying. My psychiatrist says, this is how I know what I'm doing is wrong and why he knew we could make progress if I put my mind to it. I also tend to get real jealous. I try not to show it, but I have to admit that seeing them having fun with anyone that isn't me, it really tears me up inside. I grow to hate their friends and family immensely, self-inserting myself into every little moment of their lives and telling myself, it better be with me, more fun, more special more magical and memorable. How intensely I like someone tends to be based on how long I spend around them and in what context. Like the less I see them, the less I like them. The more I see them, it's like I'm exposed to something they're pumping out, like seeds taking root in my brain almost. A good example would be this. In fifth grade, I liked this guy. In sixth grade, the same guy, I became obsessed with him. Summer rolled around and I stopped. School started, I started liking him again. Repeat for 8th grade. Then he moved away for good and I stopped liking him for good. It was like I couldn't live without him for the longest time, but then, out of sight? Out of mind, too. I know that's not how other people function. Normal people miss someone no matter how far away they are, and no matter how long it's been since they saw them. Not me, though, and I think that might be the only saving grace for some of these guys. I can't control my emotions even with the medication I'm given. It's one of the biggest challenges I face with my condition. If I didn't care so much about what I thought my crush thought of me, I would show up to his house and look in through the window, hoping to see him. I would pester all his friends to get every bit of info about him. I thank God sometimes that I've not gone too far, that I still have one foot grounded in reality even if the other is hovering over the abyss. Judging from what I've said so far, I'm guessing that most of you would assume me to be a violent person, like how a lot of those psychopaths and let's not meet stories end up being. But in fact, I'm the opposite of that. No one I know would ever think of me with such thoughts. I'm bubbly and kind towards those who are kind towards me. I never resort to physical confrontation, it's just not my personality. No one even has a clue how obsessive my thoughts get, and aside from this little confession, I tend to keep things that way. I hate how I get so attached to people, but as my psychiatrist says, at least you're self-aware. I've liked someone for six months currently and I despise myself for it. I pretend not to be obsessed all the time and refrain from speaking about the person 24-7, even though I want to, because I don't want friends and, most importantly, my crush knowing about my condition. Like, I'm terrified I will ruin my life because people would judge me for it without getting to know me. I guess that's part of why I'm writing this too. 
Bottom line is, I need help on how to cope with these feelings if I can. I surprisingly let go very easily. You know that kid who moved in 8th grade that I was obsessed with for like 3 years? When I found out he was moving I was shocked and sad for about 15 minutes and then didn't really care. It was like whatever bug inside my brain just said, oh well, on to the next one I guess. So, my issue is just how to handle my feelings when I like someone. Keep in mind, this is just a light description of my issue. I felt a lot more than what I described here so far. I hope I'll get over my current crush over the summer and don't have any classes with him next year since I would probably fall for him again. I rarely get crushes, but when I do, they better watch out. I've only had four crushes in total in my life so far and three were part of my obsessions. Anyway, that's about it. I hope I could provide some insight into how female stalker types work because all that yandere stuff is just a bunch of bull. That's like a guy's projection. The ignorance of thinking that guys and girls think or act similar. When honestly, the reality is much more insidious. And arguably, much more terrifying. Back when I was still a senior in high school, me and my mom went on a trip to the movies. It was this regular mother-daughter bonding ritual we used to have. Catch a movie, critique it, and then hit up the Bob Evans next door for dinner. We'd always pick up my dad something in a takeout box too, and I really miss those days. But anyway, we have our food and drive home, just like we always did, and the rest of the night was uneventful. But the next morning... I wake up to a Facebook friend request from a name I didn't recognize. Thinking it might have been a mutual, I just accept it, but then like five minutes later, I get a message from the same account that says something like, Hey, I know this might sound a little weird, but I saw you at the Bob Evans last night and I wondered if you might like to go out sometime. So I'm like, huh, how did someone figure out my name? Did they overhear my mom say it or something? Like I get it was polite, but it still creeped me out. Why would you go to those lengths to find me? And he must have been looking for hours. Immediately, there's all these red flags, so I had no intention of accepting his invitation, but at the same time, I didn't want to be a jerk to him. So I messaged him back like, Hi, yeah, I was there, but I'm actually kind of seeing someone right now, and I don't think they'd be too happy if we went out. At first, their reply was encouraging, and they seemed to take it on the chin. They say like, ah, that sucks. Sorry if this is awkward now. I respond, no, don't worry. You didn't know. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend now. It was a close-ended reply, you know. The kind that's designed to just end the conversation. Next thing, he starts typing and I figured he's going to just carry on being gentlemanly. Creepily direct, but gentlemanly, I suppose. But no. There's this very subtle shift in his tone when he says, I just figured, since I went to all this effort to find you, you might give me a chance. This is where I saw a kind of, well, opportunity. I had literally zero clue how this guy had found me, and I didn't like the idea that just anyone could look me up online no matter how innocent their intentions were. So I straight up asked him, how did you find me? He starts typing, and stopping, typing, and stopping, and... I can tell he's thinking of the right way to phrase it. Then he says something like, Where there's a will, there's a way. I can find anyone online. It's easy. When I set my mind to something, I achieve it. Is your current boyfriend an overachiever like that? I distinctly remember him using that term, overachiever. It was honestly so cringe. If I wasn't put off before, I certainly was then. But still... I wanted to find out how this creep had managed to track me down, so I might have done something stupid to get him to talk and said, honestly no, and it's kind of hot that you're so smart and stuff, so how did you do it? He responds, I was the one who swiped your mom's card, he replied. So, a liar too. He wasn't some hacker, he just worked at the Bob Evans. So yeah, he probably had overheard my name, then just matched it up with the name on my mom's card. Then bingo, he finds me on Facebook. I had to hold back from just letting loose on this guy, 
but if he was that much of a psycho, then I figured it was better to not make him mad. Ah, sneaky. I like it, I replied. But like I said, kinda seeing someone right now, so thanks, but no thanks. Bye. I mute the conversation, but don't block the guy or unfriend him or anything. See, making him mad I was worried about. Then I just go about the rest of my day. Yeah, I told all my friends how creepy it was, and I casually suggested to my mom we pick a new food venue for our post-movie dinners. But other than that, I just went about my day as usual. It's kind of weird how this pattern repeated itself. The first time I'm asleep, blissfully ignorant that some creep is plugging my name into Facebook, probably to perv at my display picture. The second time I had him on mute, so I had no idea what was going on in that little message thread. It wasn't until later on that night that I opened my messenger on my phone and actually saw the little 44 notification count next to his name that I realized he'd sent me other messages. And yes, it did say 44. He'd sent 44 different messages, mostly rants, and he'd been sending them on and off all day. But it wasn't until I actually read what they said that I started to freak out. I'm not going to type up everything I remember him saying, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you will be able to guess the majority of it. Think nice guy style put downs coupled with threats of actual violence. He basically said that if he'd managed to track me down online in a few hours, imagine what he could learn by the end of the week. He said he had friends that would help him break into our house. After that, they'd tie my parents up, kill them in front of me, then take turns abusing me until I was used up and lifeless. And that's the clean version of it, condensed into two sentences. 44 different lengthy messages he sent me. Think about that. The final message I read, it went on. Before I ran downstairs to tell my mom and dad was the message that read, I'm in my car and I'm looking for your house. I didn't know he was just trying to scare me, so I was crying as dad called the cops. The guy ended up getting arrested for the threats he made, and I know he got fired from the Bob Evans because my mom kicked up a stink about it after the arrest. I never saw the guy again, so I'm thinking it was a case of his bark being louder than his bite. But I know that there are other women out there who aren't so lucky, and their stalkers are much more willing to get up close and personal. I just hope we can one day live in a world where men don't act all predatory and creepy with women they like. Like it's so counterintuitive to what we want in a man. I wish they'd just understand that. But till then, I suppose all we can do is be safer online and with dating apps and hope we never run into that one sick psychopath that won't take no for an answer. Rebecca Lucille Schaefer was born in Eugene, Oregon on November 6th of 1967. Her father, Dr. Benson Schaefer, was a child psychologist, while her mother was a writer and instructor at the Portland Community College. Given how proud she was of her Jewish roots, a young Rebecca would dream of becoming a rabbi. But after a chance encounter with a modeling agent, she began modeling clothes during her junior year in high school. Rebecca would become a popular subject of many photographers and she made appearances in department store catalogs and television commercials, as well as an extra in a straight-to-TV movie. She was so successful that in August of 1984, her parents gave her permission to move to New York City to pursue a full-time modeling career. At five foot seven, she was considered too short for high-fashion modeling jobs and struggled to find work as a result. Rebecca even moved to Japan for a short stint in the hopes of finding work there, but found Japanese modeling standards were even stricter than back in the United States. Yet within just a few months of moving back to New York, Rebecca landed her first TV role, playing Annie Barnes on ABC's One Life to Live. The following year, she appeared on the cover of Seventeen magazine, which caught the attention of television producers who were casting for a sitcom called My Sister Sam. Through a series of grueling auditions, Rebecca won the role of Patricia Russell, and the series was initially a hit, but it was cancelled halfway through its second season in 1988 due to falling ratings. Yet the role established Rebecca's acting career and earned her several other roles in a variety of different productions. 
However, the role also brought her to the attention of an extremely dangerous and unstable young man, one that would have an indelible and catastrophic impact on her life, Robert John Bardo. The youngest of seven children, Bardo was the son of a non-commissioned officer in the United States Air Force who had met his mother whilst deployed in Japan. Due to the nature of his father's occupation, the Bardo family moved frequently, eventually settling in Tucson, Arizona in 1983, and to say young Robert had a rough childhood would barely broach the issue. A young Robert was placed in foster care after abuse from one of his siblings got so bad that he threatened to take his own life. Couple that with the Bardo family's history of mental illness, and it's quite clear that he never really had a shot at an emotionally stable adulthood. By the age of 15, Bardo had been institutionalized to treat severe emotional problems, and it was around then that he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Shortly after, he dropped out of Pueblo Magnet High School and began working as a janitor at a jack-in-the-box restaurant. By the time he was 19, he had been arrested three times for disorderly conduct, and Bardo's neighbors would frequently complain that he exhibited unexplainably strange and threatening behavior towards them. Yet, it seems they had no idea how deep Bardo's madness extended. You see, Bardo had a dangerously obsessive personality, and found himself increasingly obsessed with certain female celebrities. The first target of his dangerous obsession would be 13-year-old Samantha Smith, an American schoolgirl, peace activist, and child actress from Manchester, Maine, who became famous during the Cold War. After her death on August 25th of 1985 in the Bar Harbor Airlines Flight 1808 plane crash, Bardo was devastated, but it was during a period of intense mourning that he discovered Rebecca Schaefer while watching My Sister Sam. After writing Rebecca numerous letters confessing his love for her, Bardo attempted to gain access to the set of My Sister Sam but was turned away by security. It was then that Bardo turned to a terrifyingly creative method of discovering Rebecca's whereabouts. Bardo contacted a Los Angeles-based private detective agency, promising to pay handsomely if they could obtain the address of one Rebecca Schaefer. Using the California Department of Motor Vehicles records, the private detective successfully obtained Rebecca's address, passing it along to Bardo for a tidy sum. They had absolutely no idea how unhinged Bardo was, or what the ramifications of their actions were. Yet they were soon to find out just how irresponsible they'd truly been. On July 18th of 1989, Bardo drove to Los Angeles to confront Rebecca at her home. He was angry because she hadn't bothered to reply to any of his letters. But not only that, he was furious because she'd appeared in a raunchy love scene in the movie Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. Bardo allegedly told Rebecca that she'd lost her innocence and that in partaking in such an impure movie scene had become just another Hollywood harlot. He ended the bizarre tirade by assuring her that he was a big fan and all he wanted was the best for her. Rebecca was terrified and apparently told Bardo she wanted nothing to do with him, slamming the door in his face and rushing to call the police. They assured Rebecca they'd come over to her as soon as they could but the situation wasn't obviously an emergency in the moment, and there were no lights or sirens rushing to her apartment. In the meantime, a heartbroken Bardo walked over to a nearby diner to get some breakfast. His plan to win over Rebecca had failed, but he also had a plan B, one he would use in the event of Rebecca's rejection. About an hour later, Rebecca's apartment doorbell rang again. Assuming it was the cops, she rushed to answer the door, but when she opened it, the only person she saw standing before her was Robert Bardo. Robert then raised a Ruger 357 handgun and shot Rebecca through the heart. He then tossed a copy of Catcher in the Rye into her apartment and was later arrested in Tucson while wandering aimlessly through traffic. The following year, Robert tried to argue that he was criminally insane but a judge dismissed the idea and labeled him a dangerously obsessive but otherwise mentally competent person. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole, and is currently serving his sentence in California's Avenal State Prison. As a consequence of Bardo's actions and his methods of obtaining Schaefer's address, the U.S. Congress passed the Driver's Privacy Protection Act, which prohibits state departments of motor vehicles from disclosing the home addresses of state residents. 
Rebecca's murder also prompted the first anti-stalking state laws, including the California Penal Code 646.9, which was essentially the nation's first law against obsessive or fixated persons. It was a nice gesture, but few deny that they came too little, too late for Rebecca, who needed protecting from a dangerous, violent stalker long before there were any legal means to combat them. We can only hope these laws are direct and robust enough to stop the same thing from happening again. But given the determination of the human spirit, that seems like very wishful thinking indeed. This happened back when I used to get on Grindr, but it always reminds me of how glad I am that I'm no longer doing the online dating thing. For those unfamiliar with Grindr, it's a gay dating app that shows guys nearby. It makes you use your location while using the app, but it doesn't give your exact location unless you send it to the person directly. I got a message from a blank profile. No name, no pic, and no bio. The only thing that popped up was how close he was, less than a mile away. This happens a lot because there are a lot of closeted guys out there, especially back then. Being an overweight guy in the gay community, I had to take anything I could because most gay guys in my community wouldn't even give me the time of day. He started off nice enough, introduced himself as Jesus, and asked how I was doing and all of that sort of small talk. He told me he was into chubbier guys, and after exchanging pics, we both agreed that we found the other one attractive. He asked me if I'd like to come over to play video games and maybe have some fun. I'd only met a couple of guys off of Grindr, and although we had some good times, it ultimately didn't pan out. However, I had met them somewhere public first, so I'd never met anyone at their place or had anyone come over to mine. I figured it had been long enough and some casual fun might be nice. Plus, he was really cute and actually my type. He agrees to come pick me up since I'm only a few blocks away. Apparently, he lived in the nearby trailer park. I decide I'd like to shower first and he says he'll head over. Then, he says he's really embarrassed to ask, but wonders if I'd be willing to lend him $20. Supposedly, he lived with his mom, and she had left for the weekend without any food money for him. I know it was really stupid in hindsight, but I felt kind of bad for him. I tell him I don't have any cash, but he says that's okay, I can just send him some money through an app. I don't remember what it's called, but it was something like Venmo. I go ahead and send it, take my shower, and then let him know I'm ready. He says he's heading out, but can't find his keys. I say it's okay, I'll just wait outside for him. I hadn't given him my address yet, but I was almost ready to. However, when I asked if he had found them, he had never responded. Minutes went by, then an hour. I messaged him again to ask if he was still coming, and I could see him going on and offline, so I know he read my messages. I finally just accepted he was ghosting me and probably just wanted money. I messaged him one last time and told him that it was pretty messed up, as well as explained that had he just asked, I would have given him the money without having to go through all of that. What can I say? I can be a softie sometimes. Fast forward a couple of weeks. I never heard back from him, so I just blocked him. I get another message from someone on Grindr relatively close to me. His profile is also blank, which raises my suspicions. He tells me he's also into chubby guys, which really makes me suspicious because it's highly unlikely two chubby chasers live so close to me. We trade pics again, and it's a different guy. However, he suddenly asks for money again. In Grinder, you can create as many accounts as you'd like. All you need is an email address. There were tons of spam accounts on there that were automated. It was a real pain. Anyways, I call him out because I was like 95% sure it was Jesus. At first, he acts like he doesn't know what I'm talking about, calls me crazy, and then blocks me. I felt a little bad because I thought maybe I had made a mistake and just chased off a guy for nothing. Then again, his sudden offensive reaction made me have doubts. Weeks go by and every so often this same guy tries to fool me even though I don't fall for it. Eventually, I blow up on him and ask him what his problem is. We start going at it and eventually he says, you won't say that to my face. I tell him that I would gladly tell him this in person, not that I expected him to actually show up this time. 
He responded with, All right, we'll see about that. Be there soon. Now, I was a little worried at this point because it crossed my mind that he may not actually be gay and might be some homophobe looking to bash some gay guys. My mind always goes back to those men who have lost their lives after meeting up with someone on Grinder. However, I realize I never gave him my address. Now, this is the conversation we had. I say, Nice try, but I never gave you my address. Yes, you did, stupid. You just didn't know it was me. Be ready. I'm on the way. At this point, my anxiety starts setting off because I did give my address to a guy who had to cancel last minute, but I didn't think anything of it because it was before Jesus had messaged me a second time. I tried to think about what to do, so I decided to try and document his threats. I respond, I know I didn't give you my address. Besides, what do you want with me anyway? You'll see. I've got something for you. Now, the trailer park is always having police go by there, and my neighborhood is separated from theirs by a bayou. At night, I always heard gunshots out there, so I began to panic. What if he had a gun? What if he brought friends with him? I say, oh yeah? And what's that? Something that'll shut you up. I'm outside. I started freaking out because I couldn't tell if he was just trying to mess with me, or if he really was outside. I had been screenshotting everything and sent it to the grinder admins to report him for credible threats of violence. I wasn't sure if I should call the cops or not because if he was lying, I didn't want to look stupid. Plus, I wasn't sure if it was even enough for them to do anything. I decided to peek outside from the upstairs window and see if I could spot him. If I could get the make and model of his car, maybe I could at least have something to give the police. I live in the middle of a cul-de-sac so when I look out the window, I can see all the way to the end of the street. When I looked out, I saw a car I'd never seen before parked on the side of the road at the end. My heart was pounding me because I just knew it was him, but a part of me was hoping it wasn't. I decided I'd test him and see if he really was out there. He says, I'm waiting. I'm outside already, where are you? Of course I wasn't, but if that was him and he didn't know my address, then why wouldn't he just park outside my house? Sure enough, I was right. Yeah, I see you. You're gonna get it now. Then give it to me, I'm right here. Just you wait. I knew he couldn't see me from his car because I was peeking out discreetly and our windows have a privacy shade on them where people only see a black screen from the outside. A few more minutes go by and the car takes off. I have a feeling that he used Grinder to triangulate the area of where my neighborhood was, but of course he couldn't find my exact house because it hadn't been him who I'd given my address to. Grinder later sent me a message saying that he'd been banned from the app and they'd contacted the local authorities. I never heard anything else after that, so I don't know what became of it. The cops never contacted me if they did pay him a visit and I never heard from him again. Now I'm married, so I don't use Grinder anymore, thankfully. Still, it took a while before I was able to sleep soundly after that. I rarely left the house, and when I did, I always made sure his car wasn't around anywhere. I'm from a city in the northwest of my country called Garununs. It's a very beautiful place. Some call it the city of flowers. I love Garanoons, but I cannot live there anymore. There are too many bad memories for me, and people accuse me of something which I am innocent of. You see, eight years ago, I lived next to a family called the Negromontes. They seemed like very nice people, but they did not have a lot of money since the man of the house, Jorge, could not find a job for some reason. It was spoken in our neighborhood that Jorge could not work because of an illness he had, but he had helped support his family by making and selling pastries to his neighbors, including myself. Jorge made the best empadas and salgados, which are traditional Brazilian pastries that we all love to eat, and on more than one occasion, I found him knocking at my door with a tray of delicious empadas for sale. They were very affordable and very delicious, and I know I am not the only one in our neighborhood who used to buy them very regularly from him. It felt good to be able to help him support his family like that. 
Some people said Jorge was mentally ill, but it seemed obviously to be that he had some kind of physical condition too. Sometimes, when Jorge called over at my apartment, he would burst out laughing for no reason at all, like he had heard someone tell a funny joke that only he could hear. Sometimes his arms seemed to shake when he had out the tray of empadas for me to look at, and one day, he started having a nosebleed which dripped all over the pastries. He apologized a lot and seemed very nervous as he walked away from my door, but when I assured him it was okay and that I hoped that he would feel better soon, he broke into this high-pitched laughter as he disappeared around a corner. Jorge could act very strange like that, but I just felt sorry for him and kind of admired how determined he was to support his family like that by working hard at making delicious food. But one day, I came home from my job to see a few police cars outside the Negromonte house. All of the neighborhood had come out of their homes to see what was going on, and we were shocked when a forensics team showed up too. These are the police who wear the white overalls and masks, the ones who look for pieces of dead bodies when there had been a murder. There were many rumors about what the family had been doing, but we did not have to wait long to find out what was going on. The pictures were all over the newspapers one day, and everyone heard the story being told on the local radio and TV stations. Human remains had been found in the family's backyard, and they were identified as belonging to a local homeless girl named Jessica, who had gone missing some time before. The news reports told us that the Negromantes had apparently lured her into the house with lies that they were looking for a nanny to look after their young child, but had then killed her and buried it in the backyard. We were all shocked by the news, but as time went on, even more disturbing facts were made public regarding the murders. I remember the day that the police had a press conference with journalists from all over the country. They claimed to have found a 50-page book that had been written by Jorge that he had titled Revelations of a Schizophrenic. The book was all about how he claimed to have been hearing voices talking in his head about how he should kill women, how what he did was all part of some kind of terrible satanic purification ritual, and that he had a plan to purify the world and reduce its population. I found this to be extremely disturbing and upsetting, as I would never have imagined that Jorge could ever think like this. He always seemed like such a sweet person, but I guess I was wrong to think that. But somehow, as the weeks went by, we heard things that were somehow even worse, things that destroyed my life as I knew it. Forensics teams had analyzed the entire Negromante house and discovered traces of the murdered woman's body tissue on cooking utensils used by the family. What's more... Rather, large chunks of flesh had been found to be missing from the bodies most recently buried in their backyard. Police could only come to one conclusion, that the family had been butchering the murdered women before cooking and eating their flesh. But what's more, rumors began to spread that not only had the family been practicing cannibalism, but they had actually sold some of the meat to the neighboring community in their empadas and salgados. It was horrifying to learn, as, of course, I had bought Jorge's pastries from him many times before, and not only had I eaten them, I thought they were very tasty. I remember sitting on my couch watching the TV when I heard the news. The room began to spin. I felt numb for a few moments, unable to properly compute the information that I had just heard, until it all became clear to me in one single horrible moment. I had eaten human flesh without my knowledge. I ran to the toilet and was violently sick. This was all traumatizing enough for me, but then rumors began to spread that the whole community was part of some satanic cult, and that we actually knew that we were eating it. People from all over the city came to our neighborhood to harass the people living there, including myself. Despite our denials, they called us all cannibals and told us that we were no longer welcome to live in Garanuns. I personally had a note posted through my door from someone anonymous telling me that I would be killed in revenge if I did not leave the city. I didn't want to risk my life, so I left for the coastal city very far away from Garanuns, where I currently live alone. I don't eat meat anymore. I am purely vegetarian because the taste of meat brings back horrible memories for me and makes me instantly sick every time I taste it. So... 
Now you understand why I don't wish to give my name or give too much information as to where I live, as I'm afraid I'll be hunted by these people seeking vengeance for Jorge Negromonte's terrible crimes. But I swear to Jesus Christ I did not know what I was eating, and if I ever did, I would not have eaten it, and I would have reported Jorge to the police. So please, although you think you might know who your neighbors are, ask yourself, do I really know who I'm living next to? Do I really know what they're doing behind closed doors? Because for some of us, we don't know exactly who our neighbors are. Not until it's far too late. <laughs>